they who die with the most fabric wins, right? But does your stash overwhelm you or does it never have the right fabric so that you are forced, forced I tell you, to buy more fabric? Do you have limited resources and need to be very strategic in your purchases? Do you even need a stash of fabric and notions? Existential questions all. If you're new here, my name is Althea and I'm here to talk to you about sewing with ADHD and all things history bounding. With today's emphasis on sustainability and reducing wasteful consumption, having a strategic plan for fabric acquisition can be very useful to avoid an overwhelming pile of fabric that never seems to have what you actually need to have when you actually need it. Or is that just me? Well, me up until several years ago, I used to be your typical fabric hoarder and probably had about 30 to 35 Rubbermaid bins of fabric stashed around the house and the garage and the attic and, and pretty much everywhere else. This hoard was amassed over decades and was filled with a wide range of fabric notions and gigas <laughs> I never seemed to use and I could never find anything. I tried to organize the fabric but it just seemed like it got disheveled so so quickly. This made it hard to do projects and and not lose my scissors notions, the right sleeve cuff. It was visually and mentally vertigo inducing. I really couldn't keep my studio clean for the life of me. I mean I'm not a rigorous house cleaner on a good day, but having a studio looking like a tornado just hit it didn't help with keeping my squirrel brain on task. I decided I really needed to do something drastic to get control. I got rid of about 75% of my fabric and sewing related stuff. I mean, I spent about a month sorting and and organizing it. I ended up giving away about 20 tubs of fabric to my friends at an SEA event. I just set them all out and by the time the day ended it had all been claimed. What I was left with at the end of the day was a curated selection of fabrics that I would actually use. I've had to do another purge and clean since then um, because well, the struggle is real. <laughs> and I made a video last year, um, and I'll post it in the description, about my most recent stash cleanup. I'll link at the end of the video and down in the description below. How do you curate a fabric collection? You have to decide, is it going to be the dragon horde of the ages or a rigorously curated collection contained in a small space? Or something in between. I have settled on the in between. I have a closet in my studio devoted to fabric. This means I must be somewhat uh, more circumspect in my fabric purchases. The first thing to do really is to change your thinking and language. I'm not sure if language shapes thinking or if thinking shapes language. But how we name a thing is really important and powerful. A stash implies a jumbled pile of material pushed together with no organization or strategic intent. A curated fabric collection not only sounds swankier, but it also starts to move your mind in the right direction. The, the key here is the word curated. This really means drawing up some guidelines to follow when purchasing fabric for your collection. Your wallet will certainly thank you. I know mine has thanked me since then. Know ahead of time how any new clothes that you're going to be sewing fit with what you already have. We don't want to add to the consumer burden on our culture and environment by being frivolous when purchasing, you know, from one of the most polluting industries around. So what would a well curated fabric collection look like? Well, keep in mind that everyone's collection will be different because we're all unique and our gorgeous butterflies. So let's talk about where you might want to start. Start with 
the basics. Uh, the 80-20 rule really applies here. Think about having 80% of your collection be these sort of standards and 20% be the, the special fabrics. Of course, what is basics and what is standard to one person will be different for all of the rest of us. I don't wear a lot of prints. Um, I, when I do, they're subdued or classic in design. I do wear a lot of texture. So I know some of you live for the prints and all in <laughs> the prints, and that's awesome. Your basics would include some of those prints. For me, prints fall into the 20% category. Have a color palette in mind. This is probably one of the more important factors in a cohesive fabric collection. Having a jumble of colors might satisfy <laughs> our magpie brains, but when it comes to, right down to it, uh, if it's not terribly helpful to building a wardrobe, it's not terribly helpful. So sticking to the palette you choose isn't a hard and fast rule. I have my basic colors of forest and mossy greens, oranges and rusts and browns and black and gray, but I also add some purples and some blues just to give it a little bit more flavor. I know what range of color, tone, and saturation really works for me. Basically, the colors of the forest and the sea. <laughs> so look at your own closet to see what you tend to wear and, and go from there. For your costuming and cosplay needs, this is more specialized and, and probably very wide ranging. So very often your next costuming costume is very different from your last. I mean, that's part of the fun, <laughs> figuring out how to create the look uh, you are going for. My suggestion here is to be a bit of a magpie and look for good deals in basic types of fabrics that you would use. This might be silks and fancy fabrics if you are cosplaying Tolkien elves or leather and wool if you're doing historical Norse people. Let's talk about fabrics. I mean, that's why we're here. <laughs> so types of fibers. Natural, you think about natural or man-made fibers. Linens, cottons, hemp, silk, wool, leathers. Um, anything grown and made with minimal processing. Your fiber choice will really depend on your own tastes and, and needs. I, I tend to use natural fibers for the most part, although I do have some fabrics with other fibers in it. It really depends on the purpose of the final garment. Natural is the way to go if you are doing historical costuming, but if you are just starting out or costs are an issue, then do what you can. You just let Auntie Althea know if anyone is trying to gatekeep you away from your bliss. So semi-natural fibers are a little bit different. So these are anything grown, but fundamentally changed using industrial processes. So this could be rayon, tencel, bamboo, those kinds of things. These fibers are made from pulp from various natural sources and are cellulose based. So while they have organic origins, they do go through chemical processes to arrive at their final boss form. They can give you the benefits of a natural fiber and sometimes be a lot cheaper alternatives. These fibers also tend to hold the dye better over time than natural fibers like cotton or linen. Petrochemical fibers are really different. These are anything based on petroleum. Petroleum products, uh, polyester, microfiber, nylon, vinyl, artificial leather, and such like. These fibers are generally cheaper than natural or semi-natural fibers and definitely hold color and shape well over time. Anything plastic-based does not decompose over time and will persist in the environment for a bazillion centuries. I sometimes use these fibers or blends with the fibers to keep costs down or that is what I can find for my project at the time. But again, gatekeepers can feck right off. If this is what you need to sew with, then do it. Most of us are probably already avid thrifters for both financial and environmental reasons. If you find it secondhand, you get 
both a smoking hot deal and you don't add to the climate change burden. So types of fabrication, types of weaves and those kinds of things. So you have plain tabby or simple twills weaves. These are really the workhorse of any fabric collection uh, in whites, creams, naturals, colors, or, or, or a tabby twill. They have so many uses, linings, inner linings, fashion fabrics, support fabrics. These kinds of basic fabrics are probably going to take up a lot of your collection. You can take advantage of sales at your favorite shops. Almost every project you do will require some of these basic weaves. Looking at colored tabbies or twills, these could be plaid, stripes, polka dots, prints, herring bones, those kinds of things. It could be quilters cottons or a printed or cot colored plain woven fabric. Complex weaves are like brocades, compound, corduroys, velvets, those kinds of things. And these complex weaves are some of the more fancy schmancy kinds of fabrics in your collection. And often, <laughs> often the most expensive. These are more in keeping with, you know, fashion trends and purchased with a specific purpose or garment in mind. Purchases here might be a little bit more opportunistic than with the tabby and the twills. I have fabrics that I purchased for projects I may or may not get to for years or change my mind about how I want to use them. But I try to keep within my color palette so that anything I make matches my existing clothes. I recently bought about five yards of brown corduroy to make myself a pinafore and a pair of pants. I know I won't get to sewing these garments um, until later in the in the year, but it's, it's hard to sometimes find corduroy at a really good price. That is sometimes the, the trade-off. Space and time for dollars. It takes up a lot of space in my closet now, but I'll have it available. So looking also at knits, knit fabric is different from woven, which uses, you know, two perpendicular systems of, of warp and weft threads. Knits are made by looping a single continuous thread. Knit fabrics tend to have stretch, making them very good for movement and comfort. I used to not so much with knits as they kind of intimidated me. Uh, I grok warp and weft, but loopy loopy is a mystery and I just can't quite wrap my my head around, but I'm adding knits to my sewing repertoire a little bit at a time. I most often wear knits daily, so it makes sense to learn how to sew with them. My serger and I have come to an arrangement. Uh, it sews a decent overlock stitch and I don't tox it out the window. It's an uneasy alliance at best. So looking at non-wovens, these are fusible interfacings, vinyls, faux leather. This is most often man-made fibers with very specific uses. I try to have a variety of interfacings in my collection so I have what I need on hand, which reminds me I probably need to check my stock and see if I need to add anything to my interfacing. Uh, so look at your past projects to see what you have sewn before and what kind of fabrics you needed. And now let's talk about your unicorn fabrics. These are the super special, one of a kind fantasy fabrics that make your knees go weak and give you a giddy little smile every time you see it in your collection. You should have some of these and my guess is that you already do. This fabric may not go with anything else in your collection and you may never actually sew anything with it. And that's okay. You are allowed to have things that just bring you joy. My Unicorn Fabric is an amazing teal net fabric <laughs> with embroideries and sequins that I bought years and years ago, over a decade ago. It just made me happy and I, it still makes me happy. I don't wear much with sparkle as, as I've never really shed my farm girl sensibilities when it comes to clothing. But boy howdy, does that fabric 
spark joy in my little magpie brain. One thing to remember is to wash any washable fabrics before you put them into your collection. This will save time when you want to start sewing. I tend to wash almost all of my fabrics, even wools and, and some silks. This really helps prevent shrinkage after you make the garment. It also cuts down on the differential shrinking when you are sewing with fabrics from different fibers like cotton and wool. Um, some fabrics shrink more than others. You want to get most of the shrinkage out of the way before you even start sewing. Don't forget notions. This video is already getting long, but I just wanted to briefly mention a few other categories to think about. Fabric isn't the only aspect of your collection that needs to be curated. There is the whole realm of notions and haberdashery and tools and woozles and weevils. I mean, there's so much scope there, uh, but the same guidelines apply. Start with the basics and work from there. Here are some of the basic categories to think about. So you have cutting tools, you have marking and measuring tools, sewing tools, ripping out that damned sewing again for the third time tools, pressing tapes, trims and embellishments. So also thinking about patterning, think about pattern paper. You can purchase it or find it. You can get dot grid paper or non-woven web fabric for patterning. You can use butcher paper or brown craft paper. You can get rolls of tracing vellum for thin lightweight uh, patterns. You can use brown paper grocery bags. You can use wrapping paper with a gridded back, thrifted if possible. If you do any drafting at all, this is a tool you will really want to have on hand. So thinking about mock-up material, beware the trap of buying really pretty charity shop sheets uh, because you may not be able to make a disposable garment from it. Uh, try to buy the ugly stuff and then reuse the fabric when you are done making the mock-up. Uh, find ways to reuse that fabric. Uh, it could do inner lining for small pieces like collars and cuffs. It can be pieced quilts. It can be cabbage for stuffings. Um, to be honest with you, getting my fabric collection under control was the single best thing I ever did for my sewing and creativity. I have probably one twentieth of the amount of fabric that I used to have. And I am much happier and calmer when I approach a new project. It is much easier to shop my own collection and add to my collection in a wise and thrifty way. I hope this helps you to create the curated fabric collection that will truly serve you and not be just another source of frustration keeping you from doing the things that you love. I have a favor to ask of you. I would love to chat with you about struggles that you are having with sewing, being organized, and trying to do all of this while having ADHD. I'm developing a course to help people like us find that peace with our unique and sometimes frustrating brains so that we can sew and create the things we love. If you have a few moments, please uh, see the link in the description below, sign up for a chat, and join me for a cuppa over Zoom. And as always, get vaxxed, stay safe, and I bid you joy.